So we need to begin with the ritual way. There's this earth, and there's a world below this earth. There's a world above this earth with the moon, which is the way the world was before it fell. Then there's a world above the moon, which is the world of the sun and the stars. And that's the world we come from. So our whole life is primarily a descent. So we say that we want to honor the four directions, east, west, north, south. We also want to honor the vertical direction which brought us here. Now you'll remember that the old king was dying and he called his helper and his prime minister, Faithful John, and said, I want you to take care of my son and be as loyal to my son as you were to me. Will you do this? He said, I will do it even at the risk of my own life. And he said, show him everything in the castle, but don't show him that one room. You all remember that? And after the father dies, the son is taken around by Faithful John and they keep passing this one room and, and Faithful John answered the boy says, that room, you keep passing, open the door. He said, I promised your father I would not open that door. I promised the king. Boy says, I got news, I'm the king. Open the door. He does. And you remember that Faithful John tries to block the door so the boy can't see what's on the opposite wall. What's on the opposite wall is a photograph of this fantastically beautiful woman. That's what his brain felt when he saw it and he fainted. And when he woke up, he said to John, what do you know about this woman? I want to know what you know about her. John said, all we know about her is that she's very fond of gold. And so he said, well, all right, that's clear. I want you to take all the gold we have in the treasury. I want you to make them up into little gold filigrees and little gold bracelets, and we're going to go find her. What else do you know about her? She lives on the other side of the water. Get some ships ready. Oh, that's the way it feels when it finally that penetrates into you. And it's a part of the masculinity that Terry was talking about. It's part of our sweetness that we faint when we see that. So they go, they arrive at the other country, and they have with them uh, like 250 beautiful gold objects, which is like you're having a craft, which is like you're knowing how to do one thing very well, whether it's drumming, music. If you don't have a craft, what are you gonna show to her on the other side of the water? Tough question. It's also related to the how men bring their sons into the physical world and teach them how to do things. All right, are you ready? So, Faithful John goes on on, de on uh, land and he walks up to a uh, well. Hmm, how many of these things happen at a well? So strange. And a woman is standing by the well and he says to her, um, uh, would you like to, um, and he shows her a couple of the gold objects. She says, amazing. My mistress loves gold things like that above everything. Oh, you have a mistress? Yeah. Where does she live? Oh, up the hill there. Why don't you take these and give it to her? And tell her that if she wants to see more, there's plenty more down at the dock. We have a shipload of these. No one knows what that thing is by the well, but that's what Jesus met the woman by the well. Remember that? She sees the gold things and she recognizes them just like certain women do. It 
she goes down to the ship. They take her down the hold and they lay out all this stuff. And then the king, the young king, gives the order for the ship to sail. Well, it's his job to make decisions, isn't it? Something right about that. Do you feel it? It wasn't too... um, I mean, he didn't exactly go into a big conversation with her about whether the ship should sail. But this is forgiven once in a while, even by women. She's watching and looking at all these things. She's very pleased there isn't anybody in this town who can make old objects like that. She looks out and she sees the water moving past the porthole. What have you done? What are you doing? This ship is on sail. This ship is sailing. You didn't tell me you were going to do this. What are you doing? King says, you're a very beautiful woman. And uh, I'm not so bad myself. And... uh, I have a kingdom, and I have this castle, and I have this, and I have that, and I have this, and I have that. Would you marry me? She says, well, that's different. I can see the sense of something like this. All right. This is going to be all right. I'll marry you. Is the story over? (laughs) Sure. So they're sailing along, and uh, we, we talked about the, there's a person inside of you who we call Faithful John who's been born many times, and he knows about all of this. And then there's the king who doesn't know about anything except making decisions. <laughs> so we're asking you to identify with one or the other. And the interesting thing we didn't mention yesterday is you. Which one is you? Are you the one who makes the decisions, or are you the one who's been born many times? This story separates them very clearly. So night comes, and faithful John goes up on deck. He goes up on deck. He hears a couple of crows talking. And the crows say, You know this whole thing? It ain't going to turn out very well. Why is that? Well, you know, what's going to happen is that they're going to land here. They're going to land and get on shore, and everyone's going to be so glad, and they're going to bring a big white horse for the king to ride. And you know, if the king gets on that horse, the horse will take him up in the sky, and he'll never come back again, and that's it. That guy's crossing. Wow, what could you do about that? Well, the only thing you do if someone stabs the horse in the neck, let it end that. But if he ever says he did it and why he did it, he'll turn to stone from the knees down. That's the way it is. So, faithful John puts that in here. Because as you know, even if he gets over that, there's another trouble. What is it? Well, you know what's going to happen is that they're going to have a wedding, you know. They're thinking about a wedding. And they're going to have a, someone's going to bring him a shirt, a beautiful vest. And if he puts his shirt on, it's going to burn him all the way down to the bones and the king will die. What can be done about that? Well, nothing ock, 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 can be done about it unless someone takes the, the, the vest and throws it in the fire. But if he throws it in the fire and then ever explains why he did it, then he'll turn to stone from his uh, neck all the way down to his knees. That's the way it is. So Faithful John thinks about this. And finally, of course, there's a third thing too, by the way. (laughs) Well, what is that? You know, if he gets through this and he's still alive at the time of the wedding, then he will dance with this with her. But you see, she has three drops of poison in her left breast. And if someone doesn't suck that out, she'll die right there. So you'll never get her anyway. But what can be done? Well, someone has to suck that, uh, those uh, drops of poison out of her breast. But if he ever explains why he does that, 
Then he'll change the stone from the top of his head down to his chest. So that'll be it. That's the way it is, though. That's the way it is. 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 So. So are we moving? We're moving. Time is going by. Getting time to get to shore. Finally, the boat comes to shore. Everybody's excited. They've been watching this boat come. Probably have passenger pigeons, you know, send messages and shit. He's coming with the bride. These are big, heavy actions. This is a little like Princess Die. Anybody who thinks that life is going to go easily for a queen is out of their mind. So, the king gets off. Faithful John gets off. She gets off. Someone comes up leading a great, big, beautiful white horse and says to the king, would you like to ride to your castle on this white horse that we have saved for you and gotten all ready for you? It's the most beautiful one we could find for 100 miles. King says, I would like that. King's a little inflated, do you remember that? Those moments. Faithful John steps up, takes a big knife, stabs the horse in the neck, the blood flows all over, the horse drops. King says, why'd you do that, John? Are you a little jealous, John? I have the woman and you don't. Could it be connected with that, John? He thinks that, but he doesn't say it. All he says is, why'd you do that, John? John doesn't say anything. The king feels a little humiliated. Can you feel it? Everybody's watching. You're the king. And this man without even consulting with you, walks over, choo, and you feel how the king feels? Humiliated in front of everybody? Not in control, hmm? Why, well, you gotta give him credit. He overcomes that. He says, okay, we'll walk to the castle. So they all walk to the castle. And they come out carrying a beautiful vest, gold, silver threads, Persian in design, Guatemalan in inspiration. <laughs> Been blessed, of course, by these two guys, you know. A lot of smoke on this vest. <laughs> but they weren't there when the vest was made. So, the vest is, is presented formally to the king. And it said, this vest comes with the best wishes of all of those in your kingdom. We are giving you this vest because of the greatness of your heart and your discipline and so on and so on, the way people say such things. They pass it to him. They're just moving around behind to put it on his shoulders. And he takes. Faithful John reaches over, takes the thing, and throws it in the fire. Ah! This time he speaks. John! John! What are you doing? Why did you do that, John? Tell me. 
You said you'd be faithful to me as you were to my father. You can't stand to see me uh, wear this vest, is that it, John? Hmm? You want to stay there a little while? One of the things that this story talks about is the gifts that you may get by doing work of this sort. But there's a sense that these white horses have been waiting a long time to be honored. And these vests have been waiting a long time. They are some of those lion and tiger energies that Robert was talking about that the, the ancient people understood better than we understand it. And the white horse can carry you right up in the sky and you're never going to be heard from again. Hmm? Are we saying anything? We're dealing with dangerous stuff here. What? Let's come back to it in a minute. We'll just go on with this. Then think about what the vest would mean. That's around your heart. Think about the danger of having a vest come to you. And you put it on. Hmm. Are you ready with the third one? So, Despite the burning of the vest and the shock and depression that threw everyone into, they still decide to have the wedding. And before the wedding, they have that old formal European dance. And of course, the two that go out in front are the king and, uh, and the golden woman, is that right? They're the one who go in the center as everybody claps. You've seen this, this scene? and they start to dance. Suddenly, the woman faints. Iron John goes up, I mean Faithful John goes up, takes a hold of her. Getting the Johns mixed up here now. <laughs> but in some way it is the same one. Some way it is the same one. Faithful John goes up, takes a hold of her, carries her into the next room, and puts her down, opens the, the bodice, and sucks the left breast. And what does the king say? John, you've gone over the line this time. You've really, really gone over the line. This is way too far, John. I know all this shit about prime ministers and all of that, and faithfulness, but you've gone way over the line. <laughs> She wakes up, by the way, and she's fine. So it has several questions in it. If you're with a woman, who is going to suck the, the um, poison out of the left breast? So we'll come to that in a second here. Um, so how does the story go? So they go through at the wedding. And then the king says, John, John, that was not a good thing you did. And I've decided that the best thing for you would be a hanging. I'm sorry it's come to this. But I don't think that you have been faithful to me. I don't think you are a faithful John. Tell me why you did this, John. He won't answer. Okay, if you're not gonna answer, I don't have any choice. 
get it set up for Monday morning, and we will <laughs> we'll get this unpleasant thing over with. Well, are you ready for this part of the story? It's one of those things in which he's standing up there, and she comes, and she says, you know, there's something I feel is wrong here. I feel something is off for you just to hang him. You know, can't we talk to him once more? Can't both of us talk to him? Can't we say what this is? Can't we ask him for this before we hang him? Can't we just take him aside? Is this the way a good woman would talk in that situation? And so they take him aside and they say, John, you know, we've come to the end now. John tells them the story about the crows. Tells them the first story, and as he talks about the white horse, um, he's standing up in the gallows already, and he turns to stone from the knees down. And then he tells him the story of the second one and the burning of the, uh, of the chest, which would otherwise have burned right through and killed the young king. And he tells that story, and uh, he turns to stone from the neck down, and only the head is still speaking. And then he tells him the story about the crows had told him about the sucking the bread, the poison from the breast, and when as soon as he tells him why he did that, he turns to stone there, and it's a stone statue standing there. Well, what happens? The, the king and the, and the woman weep, don't they? Let's have that sound. Oh! 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 Come on, hit your chest in the old way. Oh! that goes along with that. Stupid, 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 stupid. Is that right? That's one of the words. Stupid, 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 stupid. All right, so how is this going to be resolved? We'll leave that till tomorrow morning. But I just want you to know one thing. That they took this statue a faithful John, the king and the queen, and they put it in their bedroom. It's a good detail. So every time they made love, they could look over and see the one whom was Ted turned to stone. Hmm? There's something great about that. And it reminds me of all of these little bedrooms in the suburbs with the windows so high, you know? Why are those little fucking windows so high? They must have this statue underneath the window. <laughs> and how well does your love making go when there's this big guy in the room made of stone who used to be your best friend? Hmm? Sounds like once a week to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>we have 10 minutes we have 10 minutes to come down into the first one to say that these powerful forces in the psyche uh, only faithful john knows about them your 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 executive your boss doesn't know and the more the universities diminish the the understanding of the greatness and the depth of uh, of human beings uh, the more the head of the department doesn't know anything about this Ask the head of the sociology department what he knows about this white horse and shit. Nothing. Is that right? And the Christian church is doing it too. I mean, uh, at least the Catholics had a, a virgin up there, a very powerful one, almost like the one on the wall. And I'm a Protestant, and uh, we decided we, we didn't like that kind of art. And uh, we just like the white walls, you know? <laughs>
<clears throat> Makes us feel better. <laughs> so you ask a Protestant about this story, again, no, 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 I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Just, uh, you know, you get a horse trainer, that's the thing. You know, <laughs> <is> a... <laughs> so, so therefore, we're going through a strange time now in which, partly uh, because of um, the work of Freud and Jung, partly because of some work in alchemy coming back, partly because the uh, industrial society has proved to be such a total disaster that everyone has gotten extremely small. Um, people in desperation are going back and trying to see what they could possibly bring into their lives. And men are remembering when they fainted, when they saw the first girl when they were 14 or 15. And we talked about the fact that this girl has several levels in it, and one we mentioned was the absolute astonishment that the young male feels at 14 or 15 when he sees this girl. And another level above, above that is, your, is all the genes in you that are feminine. And uh, I accept everything that was said here about not describing relationship as feminine. That's quite right. It's masculine sweetness. At the same time, there's many feminine genes because we were created out of a neutral or female uh, uh, fetus in the womb. And above that, you come to the third level, which is which the ancient world always called Sophia. This one on the wall is Sophia. And the Jews had a tremendous amount to do with Sophia. Sophia is imagined as someone who looks about 35 years old, but is 10, 15,000 years old. And in her, all of the wisdom of the world is. And as you know, the great split between the Western and Eastern Catholic churches were because the, the, uh, the, the, the people in uh, Turkey, uh, in Byzantium, uh, understood so much better the, the place of Sophia in the world. And they would not release her. And that great cathedral is called Santa Sophia, Hagia Sophia in, in, in Constantinople. In the West, we moved over to a 14-year-old girl uneducated the mother of Jesus instead of Sophia. Hmm? That's all put down. People never talk about that. But the ancient world was considered that was such a disaster for the West that they refused to go along with it. So, you know, in the Middle Ages, they tried to return some of that, but the painters, by having great annunciations, and it showed the Virgin there, and great angels coming down, and so on, and she'd be well-dressed, and so on. But you couldn't really attach it. You couldn't really attach that incredible old knowledge of Sophia. And in uh, the New Testament, the translators of the Old Testament and the New Testament betrayed everyone by translating the word Sophia as wisdom. And you can still see it in the Old Testament. You can see, read it, it'll say, wisdom goes to the top of the buildings and says, all of you who want knowledge, come to me. That is not wisdom. That is a female, feminine, divine energy who goes to the tops of the buildings in, in Jerusalem and calls out, all of you who want knowledge, come to me. Those of you who are satisfied with pop shit, stay where you are. We don't want you anyway. If what you like is jokes, forget it. So the call went out. You hear the call? That was Sophia's call. Those who are intelligent come to me. So that call is going out again. And I think the root of the women's movement lay in that call. But since many of the women are not, don't have a faithful Joanna, but they only have a king or a queen, it turned into a movement of anger, which it still is. Remember that story? The spirit is caught in a little bottle in the roots of the trees, and the young uh, uh, boy goes out there. He has heard the call. He leaves his father, who is cutting wood at noon, and says, I'll take a walk. 
He goes to the place, he sees a, a voice coming out of the root. Let me out, let me out, please let me out. He opens a bottle, and on the first person says, I am the spirit Mercurius. I've been in there for a thousand years, and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> what, what? You just let me, I just let you out. I don't care about this small talk. <laughs> I said I'd kill whoever let me out, and I'm going to do it. So, so therefore, there's a danger here that this story talks about. What else do you want to say, Robert? Help me with this. Where are we? You're, st you're still wanting to address the story itself? Yeah. Well, I, I never had realized how much, uh, how much the theme of, of the one in the psyche that knows the sacrifice needs to be made. Uh huh. I never had seen that as clearly. And uh, I really appreciated the way in which you were picking up on the, uh, the, way, in which this <clears throat> the way in which this story uh, does name these great forces in the psyche. And it does name the fact that some wisdom uh, in the psyche knows that bad things will happen if, if the king has these things without transformation. And uh, I'm going to be talking about that a little later. I mean, I, 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 the synchronicity of, of your emphasis on that and this story itself. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the horse sacrifice mm -hmm. and how it relates to the story. So. so you understand what's being said here is that yeah. when you're moving into something that's not ethics, as it has been in religion now for centuries, you're going to need more than ever your connection with Faithful John. And many things are going to happen that you'll find unacceptable. And then, but I think the main thing it says uh, is, that, is that the inflation that we get into, that the whole, whole new age is into now, because one realizes how close these healing powers are, that that inflation is exactly what carries people up into the, into the uh, clouds. It's also related to Terence's uh, discussion of grandiosity mm -hmm. and the need and the need uh, to really address the the, the uh, demonic side of that grandiosity. And so I, I think that ties together to Terence's discussion and. Uh, and uh, Robert used the word inflation. That's the classical Jungian word to talk about the the grandiosity that takes you off of uh, out of the body and and into the never never land, into Disneyland. <laughs> and isn't there a possibility that that's exactly what's happening in the whole culture? The emphasis on Disney, on fantasy on violence that doesn't kill anyone, um, and uh, even the internet with that incredible power that's being given into the hands of people, and they imagine now that they can do research better than anyone in the, in the Middle Ages because they can call up all this stuff immediately. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, communication mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I can... Please, about, please. About that grandiosity, one thing I really struck, I'm struck by is the natural enmity between Faithful John and the king. And that when Faithful John does what he needs to do to be faithful, it really pisses the king off. <clears throat> Faithful John saying, you need to divest. You, need, you don't need that horse. You need to come down off that grandiosity. And the king experiences that, not as care, but as betrayal and humiliation. Yeah. I really hear that in that story. Mm -hmm. yeah, they do. Yeah. And all of us know that terrible sentence that he, he spoke today, that one way uh, out of shame is grandiosity. 
and um, and I have been dealing with that tremendously because I'm doing my selected poems now, and I'm going to do them by a decade rather than by book. So I've been looking at all the poems I had in the 50s and the 60s, and then in the middle of the 70s, um, in the late 60s, in the middle of the 70s, what happened is that for various reasons my shame deepened a lot. And my response was to write a long poem called Sleepers Joining Hands, which is one of the worst things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And it's got the most tremendous images in it. And the whole thing means absolutely nothing. Because I was taken by grandiosity up into some area in which a saint could have written well about that. But, but I was up there impelled by my shame fuel. Am I saying anything to you? Mm. It's amazing mm. when I look at it that the images are themselves all brilliant, and yet they, it, it, it says nothing, absolutely nothing to the heart at all. Mm. And I had to throw away the whole thing. I spent three or four years working on that very hard. Mm. That's an example of a white horse artistically carrying you up into the sky. And, uh, and uh, obviously I wasn't listening to a faithful John, mm. right? The faithful John would have said to me, you know, this is too lofty. Mm. I would have said, what are you, jealous or something? Mm. Yeah. You want, want me to be Norman Mailer, is that it? <laughs> 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 Please. Is there, I don't know, I was struck by having stolen the woman. By having kidnapped a woman. Mm -hmm. And then you said there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't say nothing wrong with it, it's just that that's proper behavior sometimes. And that may be proper behavior in this time. It's a passionate act, isn't it, to start off? What do you say about stealing the woman? I mean, that's the old way we always got women in the past. <laughs> Are you talking about uh, uh, faithful, when, faithful John? Yeah, when, they, when they, they took off with the boat and started off without telling her that they, where they were going. Oh. Well, I, I see, I'll get into this uh, next hour, but it's... Uh, Faithful John, I'm reading that out to be there's a there's a sort of a priestly aspect of the unconscious, and there's a there's a mystery behind all this. So what appears to be a kidnapping hmm. is really a part of a plan of uh, of transformation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so uh, so you know to to the uh, what they used to call to the carnal eye, what it may look like a, a kidnapping. Uh, but uh, and Rumi's full of this. But to but to uh, but to the eye that knows what's going on, uh, Muhammad's eye, for example, in in Rumi, uh, it was an act of uh, mercy. Aris? Yes, please. I mean, how many of us are not with women to begin with when we first meet them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the, that's another point. Is that I mean, we have our, yeah. have our agenda? <coughs> isn't there a agenda? <coughs> But that's true. But so we meet him for a cup of coffee, or we say we want to be friends, or. But we must make sure we understand that this is a woman is a divine also, exactly in Galib's poems. There are no ver adverbs or no pronouns somehow in this whole story. How did you get connected with the divine? Did you ask the divine, you know, would you like to go with me on a ship? Mm -hmm. well, I don't think so. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. It's also part of the thing about being swept away. There, there, is, a, mm -hmm. there is a cultural yeah. imperative, and, and, and there's a demand that it's, and it's something, but it's also the boss that does it. It's not, it's not Faithful John no. who says, I think this is a good idea. It's a, he, he, and this is one something that's saying, that, 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 that active male thing saying, well, here it is, it's my ship, cut the ropes, we're heading out, and Yep. There's something in that. But there's also something else that hasn't been talked about. It's two points. One of them is that all courting is a subversive act to society. And that every time you're going to go with a woman, you're breaking up the original family groups of her family and your family in order to get together. And this creates a great deal of animosity between the clans. And spiritually speaking, you have to see the woman as your own soul that you're courting. And if you're courting your own soul, you never do it willingly. You always try to take her. And it's only then that the three tests come in that the faithfulness is tested. Mm -hmm. Because if court, court, courting is taught by the elders properly, then those three tests don't come in in that form. Mm -hmm. All right, and therefore you do not have to abduct. But if you, haven't, if you haven't got that straight, once you've abducted, then the tests come in and there you go. But if you're busy being a good, a good boy, you'll be standing on the dock a long time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or marrying an ogress. That's right. Mm -hmm. Marrying an ogress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where we leave that today. And uh, so I want you to think this afternoon when you're doing the ritual. Are you ready to begin, Martin? Yeah.
um, during the ritual and so on, think over this whole situation. See if you can relate this to events in your own life. Uh, the burning. Some of the armor that we put on is meant to prevent the burning. And if we had had elders who would have been better with us, we might not have had to put on that much armor. <laughs> They're advancing towards us, I can feel it. 